start our recording. And so we're going to go ahead and get started. Let's start with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you this Holy Week, this Palm Sunday. Uh, we cry out with the crowds, Hosanna, which means save us now. We see Jesus uh, coming to us as our King and our Savior, the one who would go to the cross, but also the tomb, and then out to the other side, alive again for our sake. We are saved because of what our King has done for us. So we ask you to bless us, especially this special week of Holy Week. We pray that you be with all of our worship, all of our time together. And we ask your blessing upon this time that we now have in your word. Thank you, Lord, for your gifts to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so um, I had asked you to share your favorite um, uh, Easter tradition or Easter memory. Hopefully that was a fun trip down memory lane. Uh, just a reminder, speaking of Easter, we have three services next week, 7, 9, and 11. And uh, the elders are putting on a, a breakfast between the seven and the nine o'clock service, so about eight o'clock. And so as such, we, with everything going on, obviously we won't have Bible study next week, but we will pick up again the following week, okay? So looking forward to that. Um, uh, I've also just got to say at our 815 service, if you were there, um, it, uh, you, you heard one of our confirmands, our first of our five confirmands this year, giving their statement of faith, Harper, and I just thought she did a fantastic job. Didn't she do a great job? Yeah, and just the, I mean, not only delivering, but what she said was, I, I read it, uh, you know, you never know what you're going to get when you receive these statements of faith back, and, and I just thought, wow, that's, uh, that's really profound. That's really wonderful. So, um, very thankful for that. So um, we're going to hear the other confirmands uh, the week after Easter, so the 24th. Uh, two will be at the early service, two will be at the late service, so just so you know. Okay, let's go ahead and get um, started here on our study. Um, like I said, we're still in scene five, Roman numeral four, the very last verse of chapter three, Jonah chapter three. So God changes his verdict. Um, I'll reread um, the starting at verse 6 and go through verse 10, just so we kind of get a running start at this here. So the word uh, that everyone was believing Jonah and calling for a fast and putting on sackcloth, the word, uh, presumably the word of, of Jonah as well, reached the king of Nineveh. And he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh, By the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. All right, so first question on the handout, page four of the handout, what did God see? Okay, he saw repentant people. What specifically? That's right. What did he see among the repentant people? Fasting? Sackcloth? Right. So it wasn't just words. They were actually doing something. Yeah, sorry. Thanks for the manning the microphone. Sometimes, though, I'm happy to repeat it if it's uh, just a quick answer. Um, okay, so oh, I, guess, I right. guess I think it was from the top down, too, right? We talked about all levels. Right. We're repenting. Right. It was it was a whole societal thing. And and starting all the way up at the king, which we said last week was important, if the king hadn't participated, you know, was this a 
complete repentance of a nation, but it was. And, and not only was it all the people, but it was all the beasts, the creatures were involved too, right? Now, this doesn't say it in Jonah chapter 3, verse 10, but what are we assuming that God also saw? Not just outer works, but what? Their hearts, repentant hearts, right? In, in, on Ash Wednesday, we often hear from the prophet Joel who says, rend not your garments, but rend your hearts. Repentance starts and belongs in the heart. And of course, it displays itself outwardly. And so we trust that, of course, God saw all of it. Oh, again, I'm preempting myself here. Um, so the, the question is from Joel chapter 2. If someone would like to look that up, Joel chapter 2, verses 12 through 14, Mike says he has it. And if you could read it, that would be great. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Thank you. A couple of things in there. So first of all, did you hear the, um, uh, the, the question, who knows? Maybe God will turn and relent. Well, who's asking that question? That same question. The king of Nineveh. So you hear these echoes of scripture, even in the mouths of a pagan king. Uh, secondly, does anyone recognize that as our Lenten verse that we've been singing before the gospel reading uh, throughout the season of Lent? It comes from scripture. It comes from Joel chapter 2. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, um, abounding in steadfast love. And so that is, um, um, if you just allow your eyes, by the way, just to peek ahead to chapter 4, verse 2, Jonah's going to quote that back at God, but actually he's going to quote it back at God like it's a problem, like he was mad that that's the way he is. But anyway, you hear these echoes of scripture all throughout, and I just wanted to make some of those connections real quick. Yeah, David. Yeah, thanks. The king was involved in, you know, in the rep repentance in terms of the, you know, the uh, uh, corporate or the collective judgment of God on, on the people. It wasn't just on individuals. It was on right. the entire city. Right. So I'm just curious it, what, what... Very significant. Yeah, um, you're, you're absolutely right. It, it's a corporate confession. It's a corporate repentance. And if the head of the body, so corporate, meaning you know, body of the body, the whole body, if the head of the body isn't repentant and just said, well, that's fine if all of you do that, but I'm fine. I'm good. Especially as the, the king was the, the, um, it, the epitome of the, the symbol, more than just a symbol, the actual embodiment of the nation. Uh, again, if the head of the body were not participating, then is it a true and, and full repentance? So it is absolutely significant. Uh, not to mention a miracle that the king and all the people were convicted and were turning. This was the power of the word of God at work. Absolutely. Uh, no, no other way to explain it. So hearing what we've heard from Joel and from Jonah, is God only concerned with outward works of repentance? The answer is obviously no. He's concerned with uh, the heart. He's concerned with the heart. And so, uh, of course, we can make um, uh, many connections here. Uh, I recently went through this with the confirmands in my confirmation class with the eighth graders who are preparing to take their first communion from Martin Luther's small catechism on the sacrament of the altar. Uh, he asks, who receives the sacrament worthily? So in other words, who's worthy to receive Holy Communion? And, and asking about how it is you, you get yourself worthy. What is it that makes you worthy? Well, Martin Luther writes, fasting and bodily preparation are certainly fine outward training. So in other words, it's not wrong to fast. 
to get ready for communion or to prepare yourself in some other way, whether it's by prayer, whether it's by meditation on God's word, whether it's by some kind of outward preparation to come up to communion and receive that special gift that we look forward to on Sundays. But notice what he says next, that person is truly worthy and well prepared, who has faith in these words given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. So the person who receives communion worthy is the person who believes in what Jesus says. First of all, this is my body and blood, and this is given for me, for the forgiveness of my sins, for you, for the forgiveness of your sins. Do you have faith in those words? And, and if this is for the forgiveness of my sins, then it must mean that I am a sinner in need of forgiveness, right? So, you know, that is the, the person who is receiving communion worthily, who believes that they need forgiveness, that they are receiving forgiveness, and that Christ's promise is for them. So, um, again, fasting and bodily preparation might help us focus on that, but that's not what makes someone prepared in the end. And as we've heard, um, uh, God is concerned first and foremost with the heart rather than with outward works. So, are outer works of repentance wrong? No, like we said, no. But when can they become an issue? When do they become the issue? Brenda? When they're done for the wrong reasons. Okay. When they're done for the wrong reasons. Doesn't reason. display with the heart. So what, what wrong reason might it be? Um, to show some, someone else how pious they are or, mm -hmm. or yeah um, so trying to um show like uh almost put on display how uh good and, and faithful we are yeah that could be a wrong reason so it could be wrong when we're concerned with how it appears to other people first and foremost what might we also mistaken is happening between us and God when we're doing outward. And again, this could be any sort of outward work, any good work in our lives. When might that go wrong when we're thinking about our relationship between us and God? Yeah, Betsy. That we're being justified by our works. Yep, yep. Almost there. <laughs> um, yeah, so our works go wrong when we assume that we are earning something by them between us and God, or when we are making ourselves appear more righteous somehow than those around us, and therefore we're stratifying ourselves above it, above them. You know, Jesus talks about this. He says, um, you know, the, the, the Pharisee goes into the synagogue to pray, the temple to pray, and, right, it's just these, these large outward uh, prayers and and, and what does he say? Thank you, God, that I am not like this tax collector over here, how sinful of a guy he is, but that I am such a good and righteous person. But it was the tax collector, the known sinner, right, who comes before God beating his breast and saying, God, I am a poor, miserable sinner. Have mercy on me. And Jesus said, who do you think went away from there justified? It was the tax collector. It was the one who came before God knowing he was a sinner and asking God for forgiveness. It's not about the show. It's about the heart. Yeah, Susan. I once had a person tell me, I don't think I'm going to go to communion rail this morning because I have too much anger in my heart and I'm really upset. Mm -hmm. but we should examine ourselves as we're sitting in the pew or the chair before church mm -hmm. and ponder over these things but yeah uh, that bothered me when she said that well i think it's an opportunity to talk to her about what she might mean maybe after the service mm -hmm. actually she might have made the right choice mm -hmm. 
Um, because Paul says, let each person examine oneself before going to the table. And so what are we examining? Well, you know, our catechism does a great job of taking us through that. If you haven't read through the communion part, you know, open it up and read about that. But, but what do we come here remembering? We are remembering, first of all, that this is a promise given to us by Christ for the forgiveness of our sins, but that we are to um, uh, know that we're coming up as a sinner in need of forgiveness and receiving that forgiveness for us. And it, it, scripture does say, if we do have anger in our heart, if we know that our brother has sinned against us and it's not resolved, we need to leave our gift at the altar and go fix that first before going. And why do we do that? It's because communion is a meal of unity, unity between us and God, as well as unity between us and others. And so if something's wrong on either of those fronts, we need to take that seriously enough to work on that before we go to the meal of unity. So if I've got issues between me and God, unrepentant sin, perhaps, or anger or something in my heart, I need to work on that. Uh, not to draw away from the church, this is the time to come into the church and, you know, speak with a pastor, speak with fellow Christians, um, and, and to recognize and identify where those issues might be. Or if I have issues between me and my fellow brother or sister in Christ, again, we're told to wait to go to the meal of unity so that we can work on that before we then go with them to the meal. Um, so what does that mean? Well, if I have unresolved sin between me, we need to reconcile and, and uh, offer each other forgiveness, then we need to do that and take that seriously. Uh, the other issue is where we suffer disunity is when we have a, um, a, a difference of belief, right? And, and unfortunately, that exists in, in Christianity today, where we might not even be going to the meal believing the same thing about what's happening in the meal. So for instance, if one person says, well, I believe that Christ is offering his body and blood, in with and under this bread and wine for the forgiveness of my sins. And the reason why I believe that is because that's what Jesus said. And then the other person says, well, actually, I don't believe that Jesus's body and blood are truly present. And I don't believe that I'm receiving forgiveness in this meal. I believe I'm forgiven by Jesus. And then those two people will say, well, we actually believe different things about what's happening in communion. We shouldn't presume to go to communion together until we fix those differences until we are united. Um, so uh, we should take unity seriously enough that we don't pretend that just everything's fine all the time. I'll counter all that by saying, um, at the same time, that's not, that doesn't mean that someone should um, spend a long time away from communion if something's going on. They, they should be seeking help. Again, talk to a pastor. Talk to your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And um, it's good to take those things seriously enough before we uh, go to communion so that we're not taking God's gift for granted. Um, but we should then also be actively attending to that. Whatever's keeping us away, that it shouldn't be for long. Because again, the point of communion is to receive God's grace and forgiveness and to be there. Um, God wants us there. Okay. So, uh, letter D, talking about outward works of repentance. So, how does all of this fulfill what Jonah said in 3.4? So, Jonah said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. But re re remember, we said that maybe a more accurate translation of that might be, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be changed. How do we see Nineveh changed? Or you could even say overthrown in a way. How has Nineveh changed? Okay, so they did set aside their evil ways. They repented. They ask God for forgiveness. So they've certainly changed. Um, and just, again, how 
unbelievable it is that a city like Nineveh was brought to repentant faith in the God of Jonah. And only by the miracle of God's word at work. So uh, Nineveh certainly is changed. And in a way, like I said, they are certainly overthrown. They were overthrown from their evil ways and are now back on the path leading to life. And, and don't forget, this isn't just a... Um, uh, you know, uh, here today, gone tomorrow kind of action by Nineveh. Remember what Jesus said, talking about the evil and faithless generation that he was surrounded by. He said, I tell you the truth, those from Nineveh will stand in condemnation of this generation on the last day. So these, this generation of Ninevites had true and saving faith. They're in heaven right now. And they will stand at the last, on the last day, raised from the dead and sharing in the eternal glories of Christ. Uh, Jesus said they would. And so that's just, it, it's just phenomenal to think about that. All right, let's do um, a little New Testament searching here. Uh, I'm going to ask a few people um, to read, to look up these and then read them for everyone. Read Romans chapter one, verses 16 through 17. Who'd like to look up that one? Betsy, okay. And then following that, Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. We'd like to look up that one. Okay, Jack. All right. And then I'm just going to dole them all out here. Ephesians 3, 1 through 7. Who'd like to look up that? David, okay. And Romans 11, 11 through 20. Mike, can you take that one? Thank you. All right. Going back to Romans chapter 1, verses 16 through 17. Was that you, Betsy? Great. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Okay. This is the uh, verse that changed Martin Luther's life. The righteous shall live by faith. Just a little aside. All right, hang on to that. Who's got Ephesians 2, 8 through 9? Jack? For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. Okay. So how is one saved? By faith. And specifically faith in whom? Jesus. And what part do our works have in it? What percentage does our, do our works cooperate or participate? Zero, zero. To even say that we participate in our salvation, even 1% or one-tenth of 1%, even if it's just the smallest amount, it undermines everything. It undermines the gospel. In order for salvation to be a gift, a true gift, not of our own works, we must confess, as scripture clearly says, that God is 100% responsible for saving us. Jesus did it all. He said from the cross, it is finished. There is nothing more we have to do. We simply receive by faith all that he's already done for us. Not even faith is a work. Some people talk about faith like, oh, I've got to have strong faith. I've got to, they're turning faith into their own work. But you realize faith itself is a gift. The Ninevites couldn't believe. We can't believe unless it's first given to us by God. And so what do we do when we have those, those doubts and those concerns? Like, ah, am I actually saved? We, we return to the promises of Scripture, the promises of God and of Christ, and all that he has done for us and say, yes, I am saved on account of what Christ has already done for me. It is a gift. Okay, Ephesians 3, 1 through 7, who had that? David? 
For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is, the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Okay, so Paul is known as the um, uh, apostle to the Gentiles. He spoke to Jews all the time. He usually went to the synagogues in a new town first and then uh, to the Gentiles, but he was known as the apostle to the Gentiles. And actually, could you grab the microphone one more time? Do you still have it up, David? Can you reread um, verse six once more? And he's talking about this mystery of Christ, which has been revealed to him. And the mystery is what? Verse six? Is, this mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are, are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. Thank you again. This was not revealed to other generations, although it was certainly hinted at. And what we're studying in Jonah was one big hint to God's people that God has a plan for Gentiles. So it's not like it's a, uh, a complete secret, but revealed now fully in Jesus Christ that who are fellow partakers in the gospel, who also partakes with Israel? Gentiles. God's plan of salvation, which began all the way back in the Garden of Eden after the fall, in promising the one who would come, also is for the Gentiles. Now, that promise was traced. Uh, the Old Testament, I've said this before, the Old Testament is the story of how that promise gets passed down from one generation to the next, all the way through the, the, the offspring of Abraham, all the way through King David and all his descendants, and all the way through the, just that wreckage that is Israel being unfaithful and taken into exile. But through it all, God is preserving the promise. So the Old Testament is the story of how that promise gets preserved all the way until the day when the Messiah comes. And that Messiah comes not only for the people of Israel, but for the Gentiles as well. So through Jonah, who did the Ninevites believe was coming? Jesus. They may not have known him by name, but they knew that promise had been given to Israel, and that promise now somehow amazingly applies to them as well, and they believed. And so once Jesus came and did all that he came to do, not only for some, but for all, Paul now had the, um, the Apostle Paul now had the joy, as he said, a servant of the Gentiles to share with them that those Gentiles are now included. And so he has come to save both Israel and the whole world. All right, Romans 11, Mike, 11 through 20. So I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means, rather through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Now I am speaking to you Gentiles in as much then as I am an apostle. It's not advancing for me here. Here we go. Now I am speaking to the Gentiles in as much then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean? But life from, from the dead? If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted among the others, and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant. 
toward the branches. If you are, remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. Okay, thank you. So Paul is speaking to Gentiles, but he's talking about this issue where for the majority of the Jewish people, again, the first Christians were Jews, but and, and the gospel is going out to the Jews, but they were being rejected by their own people. The majority of Israel did not believe in Jesus as the Messiah. And so that is when the word starts going out to the Gentiles and Gentiles are believing. And so in Romans chapter 11, Paul is wrestling with that. He says, he says, I am an Israelite. These are my brothers and my heart aches for them that they are not part of this this life-giving tree that is the tree of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the vine and we are the branches. And, and so again, he's in what we've read before and here, he's talking about how these Gentiles are amazingly through God's plan of salvation being grafted into the life-giving vine of Jesus Christ. And he said, you know, even their rejection of Christ leads to you being grafted in. There is now, the, the gospel has now come out to you on account. But but our, our hope is still that Israel will be saved, that they will believe in Jesus Christ and be brought in. And so he's warning them, uh, do not become proud in this, you Gentiles. Uh, do not revel in the fact that you are grafted in and they are not. But, but fear. Give thanks to God that you have been extended his mercy and grace. So um, what Paul is making quite clear is, is God excluding Jews from salvation? No, absolutely not. Christ came to save first the Jew, then the Gentile. But the point is they get saved the same way. And that is through faith in Jesus. That is through faith in Jesus. The Jews are not going to be saved on account of their heritage. The Jews are saved just like the Gentiles are saved, just like we are saved on account of faith in Jesus as the Messiah. So how would these verses apply to Jonah's audience in Nineveh? Uh, let me reread verse 11 one more time. Paul says, so I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? So in other words, uh, did Israel stumble so that they could fall? By no means, rather through their trespass, that is rejection of Jesus, Salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. How does that relate to Jonah's situation? You have a thought, Ellen? Yeah, could you say it one more time? Go ahead, Rich. Uh, Jonah was unhappy and jealous because God was going to save these heathen people right. who had come to faith. Right. So um, what was Israel's spiritual condition at the moment uh, of Jonah? Not great, right? They were constantly turning away from God and, and not being faithful as the faithful people they were called to be. And in the midst of that, Jonah is then sent to Gentiles right? And what do they demonstrate? They demonstrate great faith. This is kind of similar to what was happening after Jesus's day, right? The vast majority of Israel rejected Jesus as the Messiah, and so the gospel goes out into all the worlds, and all these Gentiles start believing. And, and Paul says, I, you know, I hope in a way this makes the Jews jealous, because what that would mean is that means they would see that they too need to believe in Jesus and so be saved. And so when Jonah goes back to Israel and brings them word of everything that happened in Nineveh, what do you think the desired outcome in Israel should be? That, that God is gracious, even to these Gentiles, maybe we should get our act together, right? It's the outsiders showing the insiders how to be faithful, even though it should be the other way around. And so the same was true in Paul's day. The same is true in, in Jonah's day. You could say sometimes the same might be true in our day. 
you know, sometimes we like to think of ourselves as the special, <laughs> the special ones, the, the insiders, but we can sometimes lose our way or take for granted the gifts that we've been given. And, and sometimes it can take a wake-up call to show us, ah, you know what? I am just like everyone else. I am a sinner in need of God's grace. I am humble before God. And I don't deserve to be here any more than the next person. And yet God has graciously made me part of this church, part of this family. And I am so thankful for that. Sometimes we need that wake-up call to remember it's not about us. It's about him. Betsy? It seems like in um, Jonah that he's really using the Gentiles through the whole chapter to, to really show up Israel when you think of like the guys in the boat. Yeah, the sailors. Yeah, the sailors, that they showed more faith really than Jonah. It, they did, yes. You're absolutely right. And, um, and so you think about this book being included in the, the canon of scripture and how, how it makes Israel look through all of it. And um, there, there are definitely some themes of, of law and gospel and God's grace and the gift of faith that are really hammered home here. Again, people say, ah, you know, the Old Testament is all law, you know, and, and the New Testament, that's the good stuff. That's the gospel. Uh, I've called this Bible study, Jonah, a story of God's radical grace. This is all grace. This is all God's goodness uh, coming to people that you would least expect it. And so we would be wise to, uh, to notice that. Any other questions before we move on here? Okay, let's go in our remaining time to scene six. Jonah's response to God's decision to save Nineveh. All right, we'll save the opening question for next week, similar to what we've done before. Um, but I'd like to take a look at the beginning of chapter four. And let's read verses one through three. Does someone want to grab a microphone and read verses one through three for us? Susan, please do. But Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. He prayed to the Lord, O oh Lord, is this not what I said? when I was still at home. That is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, O oh Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, have you any right to be angry? Okay, thank you. All right, um, does anyone have the English Standard Version of their Bibles, the ESV? Some of you. Do, do you notice a uh, footnote kind of halfway through verse one? Or maybe some other translations put this there. Does anyone see that? It's a little, in mine, it's a little number four, although it might be a different number. It's a footnote. And what it's saying is that there's something about that verse, if, if you don't have it, uh, that's okay, but some translations put it there, and it's saying there's something about that verse that you should probably know, and it has to do what's in the original Hebrew. Does anyone see that footnote and want to read it for us? Do you, do you have it, Kushners? Do you see what I'm talking about? <clears throat> Online, it just says, um, Hebrew means it was exceedingly evil to Jonah. Okay, thank you. So when you see that, it says Hebrew means in the Hebrew, what it literally says is, and that's right, it was exceedingly evil to Jonah. That's what it literally says in the Hebrew. So on the handout, I, I put this on there. The ESV provides the literal translation of this verse in the footnotes. 
So then I'm going to go back to 310 and combine it with 41 and use a literal translation of 310, which would sound something like this. Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God changed his verdict about the evil that he threatened to do to them, and he did not do it. But it was exceedingly evil to Jonah, and he was angry. So what do you notice when you, and, and that's on the handout there for you, what do you notice when you read both of those back to back? Yeah, Brenda. I guess my question is, in the first verse, it talks about God changed his verdict about the evil that he threatened to do to them. Mm -hmm. And then the second one, it said that it was exceedingly evil to Jonah, meaning what was, was it the evil that the people did? Right. That, that Jonah saw this evil and was angry. Yeah. But then the first part, it talks about God's evil that he was going to do to them. Right. So yeah, a couple questions come up. So we see this word evil come up. And that's what I wanted you to notice here. Um, because it sort of gets um, paved over in the English translation. So that's why I want to go to a literal translation. And, and in, in the Hebrew, it's this word over and over again, evil. Now, for the maybe the biggest question we need to ask is, can God do evil? Um, because that's what it says. He changed his verdict about the evil that he had threatened to do to them. And so our English translations wrestle with that a little bit and say, well, no, God, it doesn't mean an evil thing, like a sinful thing, but usually our, our translations say something like disaster or calamity. And, and that would be right. Uh, this is a sense of the word where um, this is the judgment that God said that he was going to do against their sin. But the word there is, is still being resonated. So God saw what was going on with the Ninevites, that they turned from their evil way. In that case, this is sinful, what the sin that they were doing. He changed the evil that he had threatened to do them. That is the, the righteous judgment upon their evil, the calamity, and did not do it. And all of that combined was exceedingly evil to Jonah. What I think this highlights is that God's mercy and grace, him relenting from the judgment that was owed the Ninevites, what we would call an amazing act of goodness and grace, God's goodness and grace was evil to Jonah. Yeah, Ed? This kind of mirrors for me what Jesus would preach about in Matthew 18, the parable of the unmerciful servant, mm -hmm. where a servant comes into the master and he's forgiven enormous debt and he gets to leave without having to repay any of it. Right. Runs into a servant that another servant that owes him and immediately threatens the man, puts him in prison and tells him, pay me back immediately. Right. And it, almost exactly mirrors Jonah's situation where he was forgiven by God, saved, allowed to continue on, and then turns right around. And now he's mad that they didn't get their punishment that they deserved yeah. without recognizing that, well, he didn't get his punishment that he right. deserved. Yeah, that's a great tie-in. You know, Jonah's in the position then of the unforgiving servant as the recipient of great grace. And think about all that Jonah had been through. And now he witnesses God having that same grace upon this city. And Jonah considered that evil. That was more than he could bear. Rich? Didn't Judas kind of do that as well? Like he kind of disagreed with what Jesus was going to do and wanted mm. to take things and kind of force the issue to, you know. Right. Yeah. And a lot of people speculate about what Jonah, uh, Jonas, um, Judas's motivations were you know some people say well he knew what jesus could do and so he was trying to push jesus into a situation where he would act more according to what he you know to rebel against the roman rulers and and reform the corruptness of the 
of religious leaders and whatever it was, maybe, maybe so. But um, I think the point is uh, uh, Judas did lose sight of the fact that uh, Jesus was working his mercy and grace and plan of salvation, and he failed to believe in it. Um, so, yes, I think Jonah here is, uh, again, going back to our original statement, Jonah can mean double-minded. Here is Jonah, someone who should know more than anyone else walking the face of the earth in that day, how God's grace is wonderful, and yet he does not want it to be shared with others. Jack? It, it just strikes me that the anger is towards the Gentiles, you know, the mercy towards them. And when Paul was giving his defense uh, when he was seized by the Romans because mm -hmm. they were going to tear him apart, the, the point where they seem to lose their minds is when he talks about the saving grace for the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. And that's where they attack him, right? They seem to, everything else was fine, but right. it seems like a lot of hostility. And Jonah seems to have that same problem. It's yeah. just the grace towards these people, right. not necessarily grace towards other people, but right. not, not them. Right. So Absolutely. Absolutely. Look at letter B. We can sum it up like this. Jonah is angry because God is not angry. Isn't that true? Now, how might you respond to someone who says, well, Jonah has a right to be angry. Shouldn't evildoers be punished by God instead of receiving his mercy? How would you respond to that? Shouldn't evildoers be punished by God instead of receiving his mercy? So, yeah, we're included. Uh, that's right. Evil do doers should be punished by God, myself included. I think, yeah, they were repentant, but did that matter to Jonah? No, it mattered to God. You bet. You bet. So is God looking for someone who um, gets their act together and um, uh is is blameless and righteous because of their works no because that would include zero percent of people god instead is interested in someone who comes before him and says i am a sinner and i need your mercy and god is what does jonah say uh, he says I knew you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. I knew it. And that makes me angry. But Jonah was failing to grasp the fact that he was a sinner in need of that steadfast love and God's patience and mercy. So what is the difference between those who confess their need for God's mercy and grace and those who think they deserve it? Do we sometimes fall into that trap that we take for granted God's gift of mercy and grace and might even start to think that we deserve it? I know I do. How often do I say those words at the beginning of our service, our worship service, how we confess our sins, and we know the pastor is going to turn around and say to us, in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins. We know that's coming. And so the fact that we take it for granted is not God's problem. That's our problem. And yet, so often we do. And we fail to think about what it is we're actually saying and what it is we're actually hearing. And when that kind of attitude enters our hearts, now it's not only an issue between me and God. But as we see with Jonah, now it's an issue between me and others. And so the person who thinks they deserve God's mercy and grace is now going to start stratifying people according to their judgments, forgetting that before, God's, uh, before God, we are all on an equal plane. We are all equally undeserving of his mercy and grace. Um, <clears throat> so we've talked about this before, but I'd like to just revisit it briefly again many of us are familiar with the parable of the prodigal son would someone grab a microphone and read luke chapter 15 verses 20 through 24 who'd like to read that for us
Anyone have it? Mike, you got it? Great. Luke 15, verses 20 through 24. This is in the midst of the uh, parable. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am not worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Okay, thank you. So what did the younger son deserve? Did he even deserve to be called a servant of the father? No, he deserved to be exiled. He, he chose his lot in life and that's what he deserved never to return to the Father's grace again. But what did he receive? He asked to be a servant. But what did he receive? Grace and mercy. And he was welcomed by his Father as a what? As a son. As the son that the Father uh, wanted him to be. And they began to celebrate. So, who might we say is like the younger son in Jonah's day? The Ninevites, yeah. They were well aware of their sin and responded appropriately. Um, Mike, do you still have that up by chance? Could you read then 25 through 32? Now his older son was in the field and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Okay. What did the older son feel he deserved? Everything. <laughs> Everything. Now, it's interesting, two things, his relationship with his father and his relationship with his brother. First of all, if, you look, if, if you're there, if not, that's okay. But if you're there, look at verse 29. He says, look, these many years I have served you. In the Greek, it literally says, these many years I have slaved for you. So what did the older son think of himself in relationship to his father? That he was working for him, that he was earning his position by what he did. And this impacted his relationship with his father, but it also impacted his relationship with his brother, because if the older son thought that he was earning his position by what he did, then obviously the younger son did not earn his position by what he did. Just look at his recent actions. And so how did this impact his relationship with his brother? If you look at verse 30, he says, this son of yours, he doesn't even call him his brother, this son of yours. And so he has a works mentality and he doesn't know the mercy and grace of his father. And so who is like the older son in Jonah's day? Jonah and all of Israel. They assumed they were fine because of who they were, uh, not understanding their relationship with their father. 
Okay, so we've made those connections. We'll pick up there when we come back uh, two weeks from now, not next week, but two weeks from now. And let's close with a prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you have made us your own, not on account of what we have done, not on account of the righteous things we accomplish or because we are so special. We could never earn that anyway, Father. Instead, you have called us to be your own through your mercy and love and through all that you have done for us through your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for this gift. We ask that you remind us of your mercy and grace and your love for us each and every day, and that also you help us share it with others. We pray all of this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.